Everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Party Vila, and this is Good Listen. And today, we are going to be talking about history and civics. No, 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 don't, 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 please, don't stop this video or podcast. Just give me a second, bear with me. Today, I've got Sharon McMahon, who is a beacon of civic education in this era of historical and political uncertainty. You've all heard about fake news and alternative facts. Well, we're going to cut through that today. And we're going to talk about her journey and how she's become known as America's government teacher. Sharon McMahon, welcome to Good Listen. How are you? So good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I want to kind of begin the conversation with some scary stats. Because there's nothing better than a good scary stat, Sharon. I'm sure you love stats as well as anybody. So in 2022, only 14% of 8th graders nationwide scored proficient in U.S. history. And only 22% reached that benchmark in civics. How do we get here, Sharon? You are known as America's government teacher. Why have we fallen so fast in this world of social studies, history, civics? What what went wrong? Well, there's a few things. <clears throat> How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, it's a couple of items that have been compounding over the years. Uh, the first thing has to do with, uh, you know, our funding of civics education. It is the statistics are truly staggering how little we how little money we spend on civics education. It's like five cents per student per year. Um, and when you compare that to how much we spend funding other, you know, like STEM activities, um, it absolutely pales in comparison. That's not to say that science and math and all these things are not important. They are important. Um, But one of the reasons for that is because uh, we began to see this trend where the United States was falling behind its international peers in education, especially when it comes to these objective tests in science and math, right? Like when you are comparing the United States to Finland or China or whatever, U.S. history isn't one of the subjects that's being measured on these tests. Uh, And so consequently, it becomes very easy for policymakers who are often not educators, um, it becomes very easy for them to say, well, then we should throw all of the spaghetti at uh, increasing proficiency in STEM subjects. And that seems like a good idea. I understand where it comes from. You don't want the rest of the world to outpace United States students. Like we need to be producing the best and brightest people. I understand the mentality. But in reality, there is a much bigger issue at play that the United States, uh, by and large, is unwilling to address when it comes to our educational objectives. And that issue is childhood poverty. Uh, there is, there's one, you know, like two determining factors that make up whether or not your child will be successful in school. It is your income and your education level. And it does not uh, matter nearly as much how beautiful the school building is does not matter nearly as much, you know, how well funded the school is, although the school should be funded and the teachers paid well. Um, But those are the two biggest determining factors. And when you look at other countries that where their students are performing extremely well, uh, countries like Finland, they don't have childhood poverty. That is just simply not a thing there because they have decided that their resources are going to be spent on a different uh, in a different way than we do in the United States. So even if you have the best teacher in the world with like the most degrees and the best pedagogy and the most warm, friendly manner and the best curriculum and the most beautiful buildings, um, even if you have all of that, none of that can even hope to bridge the gap of childhood poverty, of the parental education and income level uh, that just that birth to age five is so important. The number of books your children are read throughout their childhood is so important. And if you are, as a parent, are working three jobs to try to put food in your children's mouths, you don't have the opportunity to read them, you know, 1,000 books before age three or whatever the new, you know, sort of initiative is. Right. Um, so that's one. Those are a couple of the ways that we got there. A shift in STEM education, which I do agree is important, uh, but a lack of willingness to address childhood poverty. Wow. Um, another thing, too, about and this is probably a little more anecdotal, but when did history become an old man's hobby? Like, I feel like <laughs> if, especially I've, I've noticed this more with Gen Z than millennials so as a card carrying Gen Xer. I, I kind of I can be judgmental of these younger generations now. Uh-huh. Um, so but I feel like anything that happened before they were born didn't exist. 
Like the, the adage, oh, that happened before I was born. I'm like, well, the Beatles happened before I was born, but I know who the Beatles are. So I don't know if it's a generational thing. So this is where I get into the anecdotal stuff. Like you see this on, like when you see movies about World War II or movies about history. Oh, here's your here's a dad show. Here's a, here's a dad yeah. movie. And it's like, wait, but I mean, I get that that's a genre that older, maybe white men love, but when did it become that history was just for old white people as opposed to everybody else? Yeah, that's it, that's a really great observation and a great question. 70% of history books are written by men. Okay. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of them are written by white men. Uh, and we have sort of seen, uh, you know, seen that start to shift a little bit. But even just going through, you know, like the top selling history books in the last 20 years, um, only a tiny handful are written by women. And they're probably written by women. Maybe you've heard of like the Doris Kearns Goodwin, right. Goodwin type figures. Um, and, but the, it's still because the genre is largely being written by white men for white men. Even the History Channel, uh, which you know has a lot of cool programming on it, it's basically become like the 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 channel of tanks. You know what I mean? Right. Air, airplane disasters. Um, you know, a very, very strong focus on some of even just like the channels that do this kind of TV programming, very strong focus to, um, their content appealing to older, like boomer white men. That's who is watching these things. So it's a great question of like, but why, why are, why is it the boomer men who are watching these shows and reading these books? Um, and I think some of it has to do with, uh, the way we have traditionally written and watched uh, history over the last century or so, where we have intentionally excluded um, women, we've intentionally excluded uh, people uh, who are traditionally marginalized. We don't, uh, we, there has been no emphasis to sort of incorporate the stories of women, um, Black Americans, Asian Americans into the genre of United States history. Notice how we have a black history section and then a U.S. history section. And that's not to say that there should not be uh, historians who, who specialize in black history. That's not to say that that's not a wor worthwhile genre. It absolutely is. But nevertheless, subconsciously, what does that tell us? Two separate histories. Separate histories. It's something separate from United States history. So I think that has something to do with it as well, that uh, it is, uh, there's a lot of programming and a lot of books about like tanks that is just not interesting to a huge swath of the population. And it, but it is interesting to boomer men who buy the books and watch the shows. All right. I will slightly push back on that because I feel like if you look back at history, it's always been written by white men. I mean, yeah, religion. you're not wrong. Totally. Created by white men. History also. Yeah. Uh, so the reason I'm asking you in terms of the slight, and I'm pushing back because I, I agree with you, but the fact that why is it different now? Like why now is it is it just because finally people are like, f that. That's not about me. That's not that doesn't that doesn't yeah. affect my life. Is it more just people are more self aware of, of they of we actually recognize it now as opposed to in the past we're like. Uh, John Smith wrote a book, this white dude from Massachusetts, like, oh, okay, cool. Now we're like, oh, wait a minute. Why are only John Smith's writing these books? Is, that, is yeah. it just because we're more self-aware? Part of it, I think, is, is that we have now sort of become awakened to the fact that, like, listen, we've been intentionally excluding huge portions of the population. I don't want to. Now, now I have the option. I don't want to read about tanks all day long. Like, I, I, that's, that's not interesting to me. Um, also, the democratization of information has something to do with it, meaning it's easy, much easier to obtain information that is outside of the dominant caste, the sort of dominant historic caste of like histories written by the victors and the victors are white men with with large amounts of uh, military capital, political capital and uh, monetary capital. Uh, and that's who's writing the history. So now we have access to information that people of prior generations uh, never had access to. And it's a little bit like, you know how they say the music of your adolescence is your music forever? You know, if you grew up listening to Nirvana, it's always going to slap. It just is. You know what I mean? Like, it's always going to be like, but I love grunge music. Um, or I love the Beatles. Or, 
whatever genre it is, whatever you were just like vibing to when you were 17, you're going to love it forever. Uh, and I think maybe there's a little element of that too. Like whatever you were learning about or whatever you were excited about when you were, you know, a younger man is still what interests you. World War II. You know, like there have been over 9,000 books written about World War II just in the United States. Uh, it continues to be a very, very in interesting genre to this boomer generation whose dads were in the war, where you grew up idolizing your dad and hearing the stories about it. And you grew up, you know, potentially hearing about reading, you know, reading it in the newspaper, et cetera. Um, the, your dads were in the war and it's a very, it's an interesting time. There's a clear victor. There's a clear bad guy. It appeals to the sense of good versus evil. Uh, plus there were all kinds of tanks. <laughs> yeah, a lot of tanks. Man. So many tanks. Mm -hmm. A lot of tanks. And it's so funny. And, and then me as, as again, uh, admittedly Gen Xer, like, I don't give a shit about that stuff. Like, it takes a lot for me to get into, like, I'll read a good Eric Larson World War II book because yeah. I love the way it's written, the narrative style of it. Yeah. Like, outside of that, man, you like, I all my friends have seen Band of Brothers. I'm like, I have no desire you don't want to, to see it through 20 episodes of like the muck of like the worst parts of World War II. Like, yeah. I appreciate it. I'm sure it's done really well. I just could never sit through it. So that like m military and space were never two things that I never got into. It, you it, don't it, relate it's a lot to drag me <laughs> into yeah. that world. Um, yeah. You mentioned democratization of news and and information. So. You take the, I always love to use the facts of life theme. You take the good, you take the bad, you then the facts of life, the facts of life. Well, the bad part of it is that everyone has a side of a story or alternative mm -hmm. facts or fake yeah. news. Totally. Man, it's sharing us growing up. It was never like this. Like we could watch TV and, and get like the facts and we all, and you know, obviously we're all educated and aware enough to know that maybe there was a little bit of a slant against, you know, more liberal against conservative. I get it. But now I feel like the pendulum has so, so, swung so wildly that it's so sad. We're recording this in the middle of a hurricane where you're watching one news channel saying that nothing is being done to help these people. And then on another one, they're, they're saying that everything's being done for these people. So no one knows where, where the truth lies. As someone who made it their life mission on educating people about the government and history and, and the stuff that makes this great. Does it make you like, let's use a kid word. Is it cringy of the shit we're going through now in terms of like how news is, is diluted and broken down to fit and feed different parts of our population? I think so. I mean, yeah, I think it is a little cringe. I think it's cringe that there are people out here thinking, you know, the mental equivalent that the moon is made of green cheese that's cringe, right? It's, it's it, when I was growing up and when you were growing up, you could, did you like Dan Rather, Peter Jennings or? Roka. Yeah, Tom Roka, exactly. And you watched CBS, ABC or NBC based on which news broadcaster you liked the most, right? Because they basically all have the same information. It was just about like, my mom liked Peter Jennings the most. Who who did your parents like the most? Oh, we were Broca. We were an NBC okay, family. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so for whatever reason, my mom just, that was her preference, but it wasn't because Peter Jennings was substantively different than the news you were getting from Tom Brokaw. They were telling the same stories by and large. Maybe their little human interest stories were a little different, but they're like overseas reporting and like bombing in Beirut, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but today you can actually choose what kind of information you want to be fed through a fire hose. 24 seven, like which fire hose would you like pointed at your face? The fire hose of information about how FEMA is literally just sitting in offices in New Jersey, twiddling their thumbs. Or do you want the fire hose of information that has, uh, here's everything FEMA has ever done in since 1979. Uh, you know, do you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. you, you can actually pick which fire hose of information you want, or if you don't choose the algorithm will choose for you. Right. <laughs> and uh, and it will see which one do you click on? Which one do you spend the longest time watching? Which one do you seem the most interested in? And then it will continue to be like, oh, he picked Firehose B. Uh, and then soon soon enough, it's it's trained to know what you're going to respond to. So, yes, it is. It can be very cringy, to use your word, that people um, that people are so media illiterate 
that they can fall for things that are obviously false because they do not know how to discern fact from fiction. Uh, they are more than willing to just fall for whatever because it fits their previously held existing narrative of how the world works. And our brains are actually very, they're hardwired to keep us safe from information that contradicts what we already believe. Because if you think about like the ancient hunter-gatherers and you see a wolf on the horizon, you don't want your brain to be like, well, you know what? Sometimes wolves are misunderstood. And sometimes we should examine whether your internal bias against a wolf is fair or not. Like that was not evolutionarily useful information, right? Like your brain would actively try to protect you from that. And it would want you to react on your snap judgment because that was how we, that's how we survived. Um, and our human minds still have that exact same impulse. Now we can override it with our prefrontal cortexes, but, <laughs> but our base impulse is to gather that incoming information and to make a snap judgment on how we're going to react to it. If it does not align with our already existing beliefs that wolves are dangerous and we need to run away, then we will discard it immediately. Um, and vice versa, right? That's We're still doing the same thing just when it comes to politics today. When I tell you, you know, actually FEMA has spent $55 million over the last two weeks, or um, $55 billion over the last two weeks aiding people in hurricane disaster relief, either you immediately think to yourself, well, that's not true. You, you know what I mean? And then you yeah. scroll through your social media. Bob didn't get any FEMA money. And so consequently, FEMA spent no money. Or your immediate response is like, yeah, it sucks that the hurricanes are happening. And it sucks that we're, that climate change is such blah, blah, blah. Like you, you either immediately uh, dis discard what I just told you because it does not fit with your currently held belief system, or you are willing to adopt it because it does fit with it. And that is how your human mind is hardwired. Uh, and we're now seeing what happens when that plays out at scale when you are being, you know, hit in the face with a fire hose of information that is information you want to hear. Um, my take on this, again, as a college dropout who went from the fine schools in New Jersey, uh, I feel like our brains are not equipped for all this information. No, like, they're not. I, nope. It's going to take 100 years to be, I mean, as we 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 made it clear, we grew up in the three channel universe, and then cable, uh -huh. and then the internet, and then we had internet was the the information was drip. We had drips and drabs. Now, using your term, now fire, we have fire hoses of information in our hand, in our pocket at all times, and I just don't think we're equipped to handle so much information. It, we're not ready for it. No. No, you're 100 percent right. There's nothing that then there's absolutely no evidence that we are, and all of the evidence that we're not. The human mind is not meant to be able to suss out the truth of every single piece of information that you're presented with on a daily basis. How would one do that? How do I know if the bridge in my hometown it has is structurally engineered in a safe manner? How would I know that? I'm not an engineer. You know what I mean? How do I ascertain that? It would take me years to become actually proficient at engineering bridges. Like people have to go to civil engineering school for that. But yet somehow I'm supposed to figure out if that's true or not. Um, that's just like one tiny example. You know, yeah. our our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, you know, they before even TV news was a thing, they maybe read the newspaper, maybe read the newspaper. If their family was well off enough that they could afford to subscribe and they weren't so busy trying to subsist with their 18 children digging up potatoes in a field and they're trying not to, you know, dive hypothermia. Um, you know, maybe they read a newspaper. And by the way, newspapers of the past used to be hyperpartisan. You would subscribe to the newspaper that had the belief you agreed with. Um, the idea that like newspapers should be objective, that's a relatively new idea in U.S. history. So um, there, they were, there's been no time in human history where the idea has been one human should be able to ascertain that fact from fiction on every possible topic. That's an absurd idea. No, you cannot possibly do that. Um, it, and so consequently, it is, uh, it's a very, very challenging, um, it's challenging to have the entirety of human knowledge at your fingertips or in your pockets at all times. Uh, it's, it's both exciting 
and also maybe a little dangerous. Yeah. And, and scary. And uh, I'm not sure if you've gotten to read it. I, I have not. But you knew Yuval Noah Harari book uh, about the Internet. It's called, I think, called the Nexus. And the Nexus. anecdote mm-hmm. that went viral. Yeah. It went viral about the fact that, you know, we all talk about how fake news is spread now because of the speed of technology. But apparently when the printing press was created, the number one selling book for decades, decades, was a book on how to identify and kill witches. So we have seen this story play out before. It was obviously a little slower with the printing press where it probably took them like a month (laughs) to make a book. Had to be carried on horseback. Mm -hmm. Right, and then delivered to the town, and then maybe everyone shared the book. But what? why do you think, and again, I know it's not your expertise, but why do you think we're so gullible when we see something we read? That's that, and, and 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 it sort of has to do with our conversation we've had. Like when we see something, we immediately believe it. Whereas I think that, you know, I think not the whole population. There's a little cynical part of the population that will see something like immediately not believe it. So what is what do you think it is? What what what, what does our brains do when we see something and we either either depending on what what our what our how our brain is hardwired, like you mentioned. We immediately discount it or we immediately believe it. Mm. Well, some of it, again, you're you're absolutely right, has to do with that hard wiring. Some of it also has to do with our set of moral beliefs that underpin our judgments about the world. And we are constantly subconsciously asking ourselves uh, whether, two questions. If you uh, are, encounter information that seems to fit into your already existing worldview or your already existing moral framework, You are asking yourself, if it it fits with that, can I believe this? And you are looking for ways that will help you believe what uh, what you have encountered. Your brain is going to help you rationalize your belief in that thing. It is going to actively search that out. Uh, And if you encounter information that, uh, that goes against what you already believe, your brain, your subconscious brain is asking you, must I believe this? Because I don't want to. And so you will then actively begin to use your own biases to confirm what it is that you already believe. How many times have you Googled, because I have certainly done this, um, uh, Googled a question that is phrased in such a way so that it supports your already held belief? Why is Blink-182 a stupid band? You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, why? What is wrong with P. Diddy? You know what I mean? Like, we, we we actively seek out information that is going to tell us what we want to hear. And in the absence of that, our brain will help us gather that information uh, and confirm what we already believe. So um, your brain desperately wants to continue believing what it already believes. And it, one of the other thing, the other things that reinforces this is that it actually feels good in your brain and sometimes in your body to right. uh, encounter information that you agree with. It feels good. And you're like, yeah, that feels wow. good. Uh, and it can feel bad. Like can some people have experience like a physical sensation to um, encounter information that is counter to what they already believe. Which is why, uh, you know, like it does not matter how many facts somebody presents about candidate A or like, here's all the reasons why candidate B is so, so dumb, you guys. You cannot vote for this person. They're terrible. You Have you ever encountered anybody who's been like, wow, I've really had my mind changed by this person on the internet giving me all the facts about candidate B? No, because <laughs> yeah. you desperately, your brain desperately wants to protect you from that. Yeah. Because that's how we have survived evolutionarily. I told a story. I was at a party. I, I'm originally from the New York City area, but moved down to Charleston, South Carolina a, a few years ago. And I was at a party and it was, and I, I get along, I, I, you could probably tell my vibe, I'm pretty liberal, but I, I get I can get along with conservatives. And it just so happened that at this party I was at, um, a guy from Long Island who was also conservative was we, we, we kind of got into this thing about Trump and everything like that. And so he goes to me, he goes, listen, the problem is the fact the Republicans have facts, Democrats have opinions. So how could I debate with someone who thinks anything he says is true and what my opinion is basically just opinion. There's no facts to go with my opinion. And, it, and, and the reason I bring it up of where I am is like, 
I've never had discussions like that with, with good old Southern people. Like it's it's a, a typical. It was a dick from Long Island <laughs> who, who says to me this 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 like oh this this, this thing at a party, and it kind of killed the mood of the party. I felt so bad. My wife hates when I talk about politics at parties, but the reason I do is because I want to hear why. Please tell me why you love this orange person. Please tell me what it is he will do that will improve things. Please tell me. Tell me what, what the folks on the blue side are doing wrong. I want to know. And I think that's a problem, too. People get, you know, siloed out. We've we've kind of touched upon that. But there is this idea that no matter what someone else says, it will never change my mind. And I feel like if we just – I don't want us to be 100% open up because I know it's not going to happen overnight. But if we could slightly open up to be like allowing people to have a voice and not just consider them as just opinions, I think that – that taking baby steps could really help in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think you're I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that shows that the more somebody's beliefs are attacked by the opposing side, uh, the more tightly they will cling to them. And that's actually kind of infuriating when you think about it. <laughs> if you're like candidate A uh, is guilty of the following 950 crimes and candidate B is Mother Teresa. You know what I mean? Like if yeah. if you, if that's what you are like, and you're trying to convince them that like this person is actually Hitler. You cannot vote for them. <laughs> um, the more you try to attack their beliefs, the actually the more tightly they will cling to them. And it seems like that's so frustrating. Why won't, why won't you listen to any facts? That's, that's a very frustrating process for humans. But it, you have to understand that the belief system uh, when it comes to politics, is akin in many people's minds. It is as deeply held and valued as a religious faith. And now imagine if you are raised in in uh, you know New Jersey and you grew up Catholic. And Bingo. yeah, and um, I uh, I come up to you and when let's say you go to you know to mass every weekend or you go to Catholic school, you're, it's important to your parents and grandparents and whatever. And I come to your house and I ring the doorbell and I talk to your mom about why uh, the Pope is actually terrible. He's a satanic figure, Catholicism is a cult, blah, 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 right? I give her all my spiel about how terrible being Catholic is. Is your mom going to close the door when I leave and be like, wow, Sharon, that's really given me so much to think about. I'm going to really choose to reexamine my faith in this church. Like, oh my gosh, whoa. Yeah. Or is it, am I going to immediately be the problem? Your mom is immediately going to be like, this crazy lady came to the door. She's obviously misguided. She's probably going right to hell, right? Like there's the, there, there's no sense that your mom would consider the words of a random stranger ringing the doorbell attacking her faith. Yeah. The only thing it would do is make her cling more tightly to her faith. So uh, when did religion become politics though? That's the great, that's a great example you bring up, Sharon. It's like, we we always kept those two separate. Like religion, you cl you clung on to in your politics, you were you were malleable. But now religion is politics and vice versa. You really start. There's always been an aspect of this. Okay, this is never. They've never been fully separate. But the idea that a uh, religion and politics are deeply intertwined, uh, and and uh, in many ways, uh, your your political beliefs are the same as you know, same importance to you as your religious beliefs really begins in the 1920s and then heats up into the 1950s and now as we're propelled into the 2020s um you can see for some people it's not everybody but for some people uh that is still absolutely true you can see that this is begins to grow uh you know deep roots in the 1920s uh during a time of incredible change in the United States where we had millions of immigrants coming to the United States who were largely Catholic and Jewish. They were from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, and the sort of makeup of the United States was changing. And there was a lot of uh, reticence on the part of people who were already living here to accept these new waves of millions of immigrants. Um, and during the 1920s is when you see the, the second coming of the KKK, which was a religious organization by and large. Um, the, the KKK proliferated throughout the entire United States, 
One third of the white men of the city of Denver were members of the KKK. They infiltrate every level of government, with the exception of the presidency. Um, you know, governorships in Indiana, all kinds of legislatures, members of Congress, Supreme Court justices. Um, the KKK became a very, very legitimate organization with tens of thousands of people marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. without wearing hoods um, because it became um, a Christian organization. It was a white Christian nationalist organization uh, in which they used their holy scriptures to justify their um, their belief system. And this was also when you see the KKK move from being sort of this extra judicial, um, extra legal organization of the Reconstructionist period in the United States uh, to being um, one uh, that was anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-Jew, anti-Black, and 100% uh, American. That was what that was their phrase for waspy people. 100% um, American. Um, and they they infiltrated uh, every level of civic life. Um, the, the normal people were in the KKK. There were children's groups. There were women's groups. Uh, and so the one of the biggest ways that they proliferated was through uh, church services. Pastors would allow KKK members and recruiters to come and recruit from their pulpits on Sunday mornings. And so as much as we would like to divorce ourselves from that kind of past, uh, the KKK rose again in the 1950s. And who was it that was largely upholding um, the laws of Jim Crow and segregation? It is uh, white uh, Christian churches. Not all. Nobody needs to write in and say she thinks every Christian was like this. I absolutely do not. But nevertheless, these two movements are absolutely linked. And your religious beliefs about how the world was supposed to work and your political beliefs, they, they became like the Venn diagram became almost a circle as opposed to these two circles that have, for some people, have always existed separately from each other. But during the 20th century is when we really see those sort of circles of the Venn diagram uh, move together and become just like two concentric circles. Wow. And the historians listening to this may also know that those white Christians in the South that you talk about were Democrats or yes. Dixie Democrats, yes. as they're called. And then uh, the John F. Kennedy came along, sided with the Civil Rights Act, and all of a sudden, one day, all these Dixie Democrats became Republicans. So you saw this change in history with just one pre it, it's a it, People say, oh, well, the president has no power. Think about it. Like, if Kennedy doesn't side with the Civil Rights Act, w w you know, eventually someone will, but like, how much longer do you think that would have taken for someone at the yeah. balls to do that and then for a whole like bottom part of the country to flip on one decision? It's it's pretty remarkable the power of one person, what what we could do. And that sort of leads into your book and the small and the mighty, the the what you're writing about. And, and I want to be a full disclosure here. My parents were immigrants. My my father fled from Spain, uh, and then my mom was a Cuban refugee in the 60s. So I grew up in an immigrant household. Uh, Spanish was my first language. English is barely my first now, but as you can tell, but my lack of grammar. But I will say that I've always embraced the immigrant mentality of working your asses off, you yeah. know, working for the man, all of that. And I think for a while, we embraced immigrants because yes. they kind of look like us. You know, I, you were talking about the 20s and everything, went, but then also like, oh, they're just they're just white people. They look all the same. It's it's you know they have a they have an accent or something like that. And now you're seeing this pushback against immigrants. They don't seem they don't look like the same as us, and and they don't they they talk differently. Where did that wh what happened there? Because I felt like as you write about and know about this country was built on the back of immigrants. Why all of a sudden are we so afraid of them? And I get the our immigration policies have been shit and we didn't handle the, the border well. I will be the first to admit that. What happened here? Why, why all of a sudden we went from embracing the magic of immigrants to now being like, oh yeah, no, 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 we, we do not want these people here anymore. The United States has always had some element of xenophobia and nativism and it goes in waves. There's pendulum, the pendulum swings back and forth. You know, you look at uh, where we were in the 1890s and then the pendulum swings over in the 1920s um, and the pendulum sort of during the Reagan era um, began to swing where Reagan was actually a big champion of immigrants, you know, yeah. in, in uh, 
in, in the way that he, in the unique way that Reagan was. But Reagan openly talked about how much we need to value immigrants. And so there was this sort of pendulum swing back. Um, and I think right now we're in the middle of a hard pendulum swing back to the other side of sort of xenophobia and nativism. Um, these, these concerns that the wrong people, and I'm using air quotes when I say wrong right. people, are coming to the United States, that's not new. We have had concerns about the wrong people since the 1900s, where we have passed like um, Chinese exclusion acts, where we did not allow uh, people from Asia to move here. We were concerned the Chinese workers were going to take all of the white people's jobs. We then created something called the Asiatic Bard Zone, where anybody from like a big circled area on the map that included like India, China, you know, like basically uh, almost all of Asia, unless you were here to be like a religious minister or you were some like super high level businessman, nobody was allowed to come to the United States for decades from the Asiatic Bard Zone. Um, so the, the United States has always had these sort of elements of, um, you know, these elements of anti-immigrant sentiment on a pendulum swing. And we're now because a huge percentage of our immigrants, by the way, our anti-immigrant sentiment always corresponds with where the largest groups of immigrants are coming from. Right. So when we have anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish sentiment in the 1920s, it's because that's who was coming here. Now we have a very um, anti, um, sort of anti-Latino uh, immigrant sentiment that if you are from Central America or even the Caribbean, um, that you are uh, invading. We are, we use words that they used in the 1920s on an invasion of immigrants. Um, so it, the idea that like the wrong people are coming to the United States, that's not a new idea. It just grows in correspondence to who is coming to the United States. It doesn't matter. Like it used to be people from Greece and Russia. And now it's people from uh, the, you know, from the Caribbean and uh, Honduras, Nicaragua, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As well, I mean, Trump famously was had that quote of what, what I think it was something like, why, why, why don't people from like Sweden and Norway come here? Why are they coming from shithole countries? And I'm like, yes. anyone in the right way would be like, well, why would anyone from Sweden want to come to? <laughs> what are we offering that they don't already have in in in, in these Scandinavian countries? So that's not here nor there. Um, so before we get to the book, I want to ask about how you got here because I'm not sure if you're aware of this. You're a woman, Sharon. Weird. And, and in your world, it's mostly we talked about old white guys old with white gray guys. temples like myself writing these books, being in this world. How did you find yourself here? <laughs> Through a lot of hard work, Joe. Oh, I've worked hard okay. to get here. Weird. Nobody, no, no person came and like tapped me on the head with a magic wand and was like, you're the one. Um, I had to work for it. No, I've been a teacher for most of my adult life. And now I just teach people on the internet instead of in a high school classroom. Um, but I, I've spent the last four years sort of cultivating a community online as, as you have. Um, of, you know, governors, of people who are interested in, in history, interested in how government works. Many of them are people who are sort of rediscovering their interest or actually even uh, discovering an interest to begin with as adults, where they realize, like, I never learned about any of this in high school. Maybe if high school was less about high school history or government was less about tanks and less about Thomas Jefferson, maybe there would be, you know, a renewed interest in it. And I think that, again, I think you're going to see that pendulum start to swing back. But um, I, I got here because I started making little fact-based nonpartisan explainer videos on the internet during the, right before the 2020 election, when people were being really confidently wrong on the internet. And they were saying things like the Electoral College is a, a university you can graduate from. Um, and just things that were not opinions, things that were just objectively false, wrong on the facts. Sorry, Chad, you're wrong on the facts. Uh, go ahead and Google that. Google's free. There's no university of electoral college. Um, so I just started making these little videos about that I hoped would have more longevity than just me arguing with strangers in the comments. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. Yeah. And, and what's wonderful about that is because now I think more than ever, we're hyper aware of how government works because we're seeing how it's not supposed to work. When you see a president 
put people in the Supreme Court who are solely going to decide and make decisions based on their political ideology or religious ideology. And we're like, that's not why the Supreme Court was built. And then you're seeing how they people don't understand how the legislative branch works when it comes to uh, confirming elections and that, you know, someone could be able to step in and stop things. So it is, in a way, all of the shit that's gone down has kind of helped us to be like, oh, yeah, by the way, we do have these checks and measures in place for, for a reason. And, and this is why. I do think that there is sort of like a, a an awareness that's been created in some groups, not all groups, is unfortunately right. has not infiltrated all levels of society, right. society yet. We're getting there. Um, of like, actually, that's interesting. Huh? I did not know that, that these uh, institutions that have been constructed over almost 250 years or coming up on our 250th anniversary as a republic, um, that they're actually uh, meant to meant to withstand the hurricane. You know, like one of the one of the infuriating things about U.S. government is that it's very, very inflexible and slow to change. And there are things. Yeah. Yes. There are things that like everyone wishes they could change about U.S. government. No person with any education is like it all works great. Two thumbs up. You know, like like you mentioned our super broken immigration system. Anyone with any knowledge about immigration will tell you it is it is catastrophically broken and needs to be fixed. Uh, and they might differ on how they want to fix it, but nobody would disagree with that statement, that it needs to be fixed, that you should not have to wait 10 years for an initial asylum hearing. That's bananas, okay? 10 years is a bananas amount of time to have to wait for asylum, which is legal for you to try to seek in the United States. Uh, we should be able to adjudicate these kinds of cases far more quickly. The fact that we don't means it's broken, right? So that's just one example um, of, of how you know, how much needs to change. But the the flip side of being um, inflexible and slow to change is a, a level of um, stability, a level of strength that does not exist if something is extremely flexible. You want you want something that can bend with the wind, but you don't want something that's just going to get flopped over this first time uh, gale force winds come by. So, you know, you think about it more in the sense of a skyscraper that has to bend with the wind a little bit. Um, and a lot of people want the skyscraper to bend faster. But the institutions that we have built have remained relatively stable over the last 250 years, for better or for worse. There are some things that have remained too stable and that should probably be destabilized. But nevertheless, that is one of our, you know, the pros of the American system of democracy is its stability. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to change uh, and we can work on changing those things. Uh, but there's also a lot to value and we have to be willing and able to have enough education to suss out what is worth keeping and what should we work to change? Because if we just get a blowtorch and light fire to the entire thing, who knows what it will be replaced with, right? Like a dictatorship that you know, violent, bloody revolutions have often not led to increasing amounts of freedom and democracy for the citizens. Yeah, I had this conversation with a, a client of mine who's a doctor, um, was in the military. He, he like patched up brains of, of soldiers in Afghanistan um, has guns. And one day I flippantly say like, man, I wish we could just do something about these gun laws. And my, and I always keep things simple. I'm like, I'm fine with the second amendment. Can we just make it harder for people to get guns? That, that was my thing. Just make it harder. Um, and then he came back to me and said, well, that's, there's levers in place to change that if they wanted to. And they throw my, he threw in my face gingerly said, it's like the first amendment. We all love the first amendment, but when the first amendment was written, it was written to include a technology that can reach hundreds of millions of people on the click of a button. So there are checks and balances in place to do that. But the problem is, Sharon, is do the checks and balance in place do you want to do anything about it? That's the that's what scares me about government in general is the fact that now the tribalism has seeped in so much into it's almost party before country. And this totally. could go for Democrats and Republicans. Totally. That all these changes that could be made, whether it's about the First Amendment or the Second Amendment, that could be you know, we, we cross the aisles and, and find a way, a solution. But because of tribalism, all these checks and balances are almost thrown out. 
Like, yeah. unless you were a, 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 a Congress that has full power for one party, you're never going to get anything done because someone's going to stick into it because they don't want to agree with that party because they'll get primaried out in the next election cycle because they sided with the other party. That is the, I'm going to steal in other words, that's the bananas part of this whole thing. Yeah, you're not wrong. And it, it leads people to feel like really defeated and like nothing I do matters. And why should I even try? Like it leads to this sense of like cynical nihilism of like, eff it. Nothing like all these people are just going to keep doing what they want to do. What's good for them. Um, and I will tell you, I mean, again, I don't disagree with you that the incentive structure, uh, uh, especially in Congress, the incentive structure is broken. Uh, where you will, if you if you reach across the aisle to be like, let's, how about we um, put together a, a border security bill, an infrastructure a border security border security bill, which they just recently did, uh, and then it gets killed because you know politics, right? Yes, we know, we know, uh, the, yes, we know the yes, <laughs> because of politics. Um, the incentive structure for people working together on behalf of the American people is broken. So the idea that like you're going to get penalized if you work on bipartisan bills to for the betterment of America, uh, you're penalized for that. That That's an indication that is broken because all you're doing right now is uh, propping up, maintaining and consolidating your own power. That's all you're doing. Uh, your party rewards you when you get in line. Your party rewards you when you get in line. I will tell you, though, that there's a flip side of the coin here, which is that um, this incentive structure has been, um, is not new. You know, like we can look to the past and be like, well, in the 60s, we passed the Civil Rights Act. In the 60s, we passed the Fair Housing Act, the Voting Rights Act. Like we did a bunch of cool stuff in the 60s. Listen, how long do you think it took to get to that point in the 1960s? Uh, that was not just like, oh my gosh, people were so much better than like how they were. People people in the 1950s were out there actively beating black children who were trying to attend a school. Okay? Like that's all they want is like, I would like to receive an education, please. No, we're going to, you know, some, some children were killed in this process. So um, I want to encourage people to remember that, um, you know, this sort of like... Uh, this f famous Martin Luther King phrase of about the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. What we have to remember is that that arc is not just, it's not a rainbow where over time the rainbow leads to a pot of gold. That arc exists because people reach up and bend it. Not because it is a foregone conclusion, but because people work for it. Because people reach up and pull it down so that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. And uh, the converse can be true. If we decide to just throw our hands up and be like, F it, y'all are effed up. I hate all of you. Go away forever. Light the whole thing on fire. If that is our mentality, that is not the fertile soil from which good things can grow. And if we look back at the civil rights movement, which by the way was just a bunch of relatively ill-equipped young people. Okay, Martin Luther King was shot dead when he was 39 years old. Look at what he managed to accomplish in his young lifetime. It was a bunch of ill-equipped young people, some of them pregnant teenagers that I write about in this book, um, who had absolutely, uh, you would never pick them out of a lineup and be like, her, let's go with her, she's the one. No, she's like literally a pregnant 16-year-old. How is she the one? You know what I mean? Um, so the, the the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice because ordinary people bend it. Not because we wait for the people in the halls of power. Not because the people in Congress got all their shit together. Not because they they were like, oh my gosh, we've been so wrong. We're returning from our evil ways. No, because normal people bend it. Uh, and I think we need to move away from this idea that we're going to be saved by people in government. Listen, I'm a government teacher. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not somebody who's like, again, I, I don't down. think, yeah, burn it down. I'm not saying burn it down. Yeah. We have to simultaneously, though, work within the system to change it 
and also do stuff outside of the system to bend the arc of the moral universe. If all we ever do is like, but the system's broken and so broken and so broken and so broken, we're just going to go around in this endless loop and nothing is going to get done. The civil rights movement didn't happen only because they convinced LBJ to champion this in the in Congress and LBJ had been the Senate majority leader. He was real good at making deals. That's not the only way it happened. It happened because we did this and we did all this stuff too. You know, I feel that one of the problems with our current structure is that the job of a politician when they get elected a congressperson senator what have you it's too good a job like we've made that job so good Uh that i've worked in media my whole life sharon and i used to have this running joke that a publicist or pr person's first job is not get fired like regardless if you do your job well job number one is don't get fired and i feel like that is the mindset of most elected officials don't get fired Keep this job. I like having a staff. I like having a place in D.C. I like having private cars and jets. And I have rich people taking me out for dinners or if you're Supreme Court justice, taking you to islands. I mean, it is I think it's too good a job. And I don't know how you fix that, whether it means like less money can go to these people, donations. I don't know how you fix it. But I think that's the thing. These jobs are just so goddamn good that they're like, man, I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep this job. If me having to agree with a psychopath fill in the blank psychopath that i'm going to do it because i really really love this gig yeah i i don't disagree with you uh it's not that being in congress pays so much you know pays less no. than two hundred thousand dollars a year and they have to have two houses and yes that's well above average of course you can live a nice <laughs> right. life on one hundred and seventy four thousand dollars. of course you can um but uh but um the the way that one of the fundamental, you know, like I have a whole list of proposals of things I would like to change about the way elections work in the United States. Um, and one of those uh, has to do with getting dark money out of politics. When we when we return to making the job about public service and we remove the unlimited amounts of billionaire dollars that have infiltrated politics. And that is a new idea, by the way. It's new since 2010. Um, that is part of the incentive structure that is very broken. People used to like the Kennedys, for example, of course, were, you know, well connected and they were well off. Um, and there were, you know, if we can, it's a whole separate episode to talk about everything that went on with the Kennedy family. But nevertheless, <laughs> they were interested in being in government in part because of the public service aspect of it. Right. They probably through their dad could have got enough connections to get plugged into some very lucrative business. Robert F. Kennedy Sr. did not have to become the attorney general. He could have been a private attorney and made a lot more money and not had not have gotten assassinated. You know what I mean? Um, so it wasn't that there were no other opportunities available to the Kennedy family. It's because they valued, uh, in part, the public service aspect of it. Same is true of Lyndon Baines Johnson. He was he had a, a whole ranch. You know what I mean? Like he, it wasn't like he didn't have other, it wasn't like he couldn't have worked in big oil. Same is true of the Bushes. It's not like they couldn't have just worked in oil and bought baseball teams. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Um, there, There's an element of public service that uh, is of a higher value to some people than just the acquisition of money and clout and power and status. Um, but since the Supreme Court decision um, in 2010, that allowed unlimited dark money to be funneled into campaigns. Um, you've seen a, a pretty large, in my opinion, shift towards um, in, in a direction that I don't think is healthy for us to head. There's no other, the, the only other countries in the world that allow this amount of cash influx into their systems. We would look at them and been like, that's corrupt. That's sketchy. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's sketchy as hell. I don't, yeah. What the hell are you doing? Uh, but somehow it's legal in the United States because of the First Amendment. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's try to wrap things up on a high note here. Talk about yeah. the small and mighty. Uh, 12 unsung Americans who changed the course of history. Uh, why this book r- right, right now? I, I mean, we sort of answered the why in the last you know 50 minutes or so. Yeah. But what inspired you to write this one? 
Yeah, you know, I think we have um, we have gotten so hung up on this sort of fatalistic view that uh, nothing g- can change, that I don't have access to the levers of power. I don't have billions of dollars. I'm not an elected official. I don't have a weirdly shaped rocket ship to like blast myself off into space with. You know, like the the idea that like an ordinary American can't make a difference, um, I think is one that that idea has become very pervasive in our culture. When in reality, so much of the good that has been done in this country, like the civil rights movement that I just mentioned, has been done by just average people. Uh, Some of them were born enslaved. Some of them were born in the Jim Crow South. Some of them were the children of immigrants or immigrants themselves. Uh, These are people without access to the levers of power who changed the course of United States history. And I think not only are these important lessons just to know because we want to be educated about our own country, but these are... These are stories that we need today because we need to know that actually what we do makes a difference, that actually who we are makes a difference, what we say makes a difference, who we vote for and how we spend our time. All of these things make a difference. Uh, and I, I really love knowing the like the secret history of the United States. That's always super interesting to me. How did that happen? You know, like that is always like a question mark above my head. How did that happen? Uh, So the sort of like the secret aspect of these stories that perhaps most people have never heard, uh, I think is also just a fun one to read. That's so cool. Uh, I lucked into writing my own book a couple of years ago. And, and, and as you probably know, this is like, you kind of go in with an idea of like, yeah, I'm going to write about this, this, and this, and that. And then all of a sudden something comes like, oh shit, I got to put this in there. Uh Did you have like one of those, oh shit moments where I originally didn't have it in in the idea of writing the book, but then included it anyway. Yeah, totally. There's like a couple of stories in the book that are actually interrelated and you don't know that they're interrelated until later on in the book when I sort of like bring up how they're interrelated. But yes, there are, uh, I had initially intended to tell these sort of two separate uh, stories. And then when I found this, you know, through all my years of research, took me years to work on this, found this other story that connected these other two stories. I was like, dang it. That is so good. That's so exciting. Yes. Uh, and it is very challenging when you are writing like a research intensive book or you're writing, you know, writing these kinds of uh, stories. It's challenging to know, like, when do I stop? Because I could just keep going. I could keep researching. I could keep finding new things to include, like cutting yourself off of like you have enough. Um, that is that's that's part of like the process, too, is knowing when to when to be done. That's so cool. It almost sounds like you put together like an uh, a usual suspects thing where there's like a twist uh-huh. ending of the connection. I, I love that. That's so cool. Very nice. Uh, all right. And lastly, you are America's government teacher, but you also look like Deborah Norville, the host of Inside Edition. Do I? How often do you get stopped and asked that? If for an autograph because they think you're Deborah Norville, not because no. you're American government teacher. No, no. People don't remember Deborah Norville unless you are like from that specific inside edition generation. More often people think I look like Adele. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, that's more often. Oh. Um, or Nicole Kidman is the other person that I sometimes get. It's the, there it's can the be worse bones. people to be compared yeah. to. My Lord. I'm not mad about it. Yeah. So tell me about these Adele run-ins. Where uh, where did it happen? And like, how disappointed were these people once oh they realized that you hear you start talking with your Minnesota accent? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's one funny story about Adele. I was uh, being presented with an award in New York um, for like Communicator of the Year. And so I had to speak at this award and I arrived to the venue early because we're doing sound check, right? We're doing like a rehearsal and a sound check. I am wearing my full evening glam full evening glam, right? Like floor length dress, hair, professional hair and makeup. Um, Two of the people on the service staff at this very high end venue in New York City come running up to me. And the woman is like, miss, miss, wait, wait. And she goes and she gets this other man who I found out later is her husband. And he comes running up to me and he wants me to like sign the papers that they have. And they're like, are you going to sing tonight? And I, I, I had no idea what they were talking about. I was like, why would these people want my autograph? This is an award for like communicator of the year. You know what I mean? And it dawned on me when I'm like, sing what? Because <laughs> I'm not a singer. And they they named a few of Adele's songs. I was like, oh, no, no. I, I in that moment, I was like, do I disappoint them and be like, I'm not Adele? And then they're going to feel embarrassed or do I say like, mm, actually, I'm just accepting the award. I'm not singing tonight. You know what I mean? 
So I, I ultimately let them down because I, uh, I didn't want them to go tell everybody in the back that Adele was there that night when I'm not. Um, but that's definitely like one moment of where people were like, oh my gosh, is, the, is Adele here? No, it's not me. Oh, that is an awesome story. The name of the book is The Small and the Mighty, 12 Unsung Americans Who Changed the Course of History. She is America's government teacher, Sharon McMahon. Sharon, thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So good to chat. See you soon. And that's today's good listen. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please tap that thumbs up button. It's a small gesture, but it really helps the channel. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, it'd be really sweet if you hit a five-star review. I would really appreciate that too. Um, if you want to connect with me, you can find me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note and tell me your story, email me, joepartavilla at protonmail.com. I will see you next time. Thanks again. Adios.